My name is Patrick Smith. I've been uh, in the sheep uh, business now for close to 50 years. We started uh, with a, a small operation and grew it uh, over the years to uh, 5,000 ewes. Uh, subsequently, we partnered with an outside investor and uh, grew the operation to our uh, current situation, about 50,000 ewes, um, vertically integrated. So we have a processing plant and a feedlot and the uh, uh, processing plant is processing over 180,000 lambs per year. Uh, and then our operations in Western Canada and uh, the uh, partner that we work with is from New Zealand. So I, I've selected five topics to uh, address. Uh, really the, the, the first being uh, marketing, make sure we understand where our product is going to go and where we can get the most money for it. Uh, and then subject to that, requirement, uh, what genetics is going to be most effective, um, how can we manage our feed costs, which typically represent about 80% of the operating expense, uh, how can we uh, do all this with the labor that's available, um, both probably minim minimizing labor, but also um, optimizing the uh, skill set that's available and needed. And finally, how do we, uh, how do we manage this? Because if we don't measure what we're doing, we'll not be able to make the right uh, choices and we won't know uh, whether our decisions are uh, producing a good return. So first of all, uh, look at marketing. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's sometimes not obvious who the best buyer is for our lamb. So it's, it's important to look around um, and uh, whether you're starting up or, or, or changing or expanding your operation, understand who your buyer is going to be and meet with that buyer to understand what their requirements are and, uh, and recognize that their requirements may not be fixed throughout the year, that there will be uh, certain uh, times of the year when they want um, a smaller carcass or a larger carcass or a leaner carcass. Um, they may insist at certain times of the year that the lamb be halal. Um, we just need to understand those requirements and then what and then and then we're going to look at how we can produce to that requirement at the lowest cost. So in, in our case, when we looked at the fact that we wanted to uh, process our own lambs, one of the things we recognized was the need for uh, year round lambing. And uh, so that was that was important in all of our decisions. But it was really important in terms of uh, the market because the uh, the 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 processing plant, uh, in order to be efficient, needed to have lambs on a year-round basis. And so that was that was a key requirement in, in our decisions on, on how we're going to operate. Um, but some of the others I mentioned, lean carcass, uh, you know, in, in our marketplace, uh, there's a desire for small lambs at Easter time, but in the summer barbecue season, there's a, a demand for larger lambs. And uh, in, throughout our, our uh, marketplace, we see an increasing demand from the ethnic community uh, for lambs and, and, and frequently either halal or, or, uh, or kosher lambs. And during the, the uh, pandemic, we, we realized that historically our lambs had been going to restaurants, but the uh, pandemic has uh, caused uh, the restaurants to shut down and, and a lot of people to be home buyers. So um, the good news is that while there was a short-term hiccup, the uh, price of our uh, product has gone up so that today a hundred pound uh, or 50 kilogram lamb is uh, producing $400 in uh, revenue uh, through the, uh, the, the typical retail outlet, but more often going to the home buyer now than the, uh, uh, than the restaurant. So we need continually to be sensitive to what the market is and make sure that what we're producing is satisfying that market. So, First choice then is if we're going to produce for this market, what genetics will uh, will lead to that? And as I mentioned, year-round lambing being the uh, uh, the a dominant requirement for us uh, to support the processing plant, but also to uh, meet the demands initially from the restaurant trade who wanted to put something on the menu and be able to serve it on a year-round basis, uh, but also to satisfy an ethnic market where lamb is a regular part of the diet. Uh, wanting to get that lamb available uh, whenever they wanted to have it on their uh, on their dinner table. Um, the other uh, side of the of that is uh, how many lambs can you get to market each year? And we uh, had 
been uh, producing not on a year round basis, but we'd been producing with lambs that were or sheep that were prolific. So uh, triplets and quads were not uncommon in our environment. What we needed to do was uh, move into a system where we were going to lamb three times every two years, and uh, lambs or ewes would be capable of, uh, of doing that, raising lambs uh, on that basis, maintaining their condition, and uh, having uh, lambs that were capable of uh, developing to a, uh, a market weight that uh, was demanded, at the, you know, depending on the time of year. Also, as we were going to increase our operation, we recognized that uh, labor was going to be a challenge. And uh, so we wanted to make sure that we had uh, sheep that produced lambs that were very vigorous at birth and uh, where the mortality rate, was particularly birth mortality, was uh, as low as possible. Uh, our sheep today will uh, typically, again, lamb triplets and quads being very common, uh, but the lambs will be up and nursing within the first 15 minutes of life. Uh, the mothers tend to be very attentive and the lambs tend to be very aggressive. So uh, we don't have a problem of, uh, of mortality because of starvation that, uh, and, and therefore the, the uh, labor required in getting the, the lamb onto the mother is, is minimal. Also, we, uh, you know, we were obviously concerned about uh, getting the lambs to market as quickly as possible. So we looked for uh, a ewe that would produce a, a good milk supply, a rich milk supply that would give uh, lambs with, with good weaning weights, and then uh, rams that uh, would produce the uh, good growth and the good carcass after uh, weaning to uh, satisfy the, the requirements of the, uh, of the plant. So uh, higher, highest value carcass, as I mentioned in the marketing side, we meet with our, uh, our buyer uh, at least once a month um, and uh, not, not always you know, face to face, but, but with regular conversations um, so that they can assess what we're delivering and we can make uh, necessary feed adjustments uh, and, and planning adjustments to uh, deliver the lambs when they need them. So some of the, the uh, factors we're looking for lambs that uh, will will have a, a minimum uh, birth weight uh, because that is very highly tied to uh, uh, the mortality of, of lambs at birth. So we want uh, triplet lambs to be three and a half kilograms, uh, twins to be at least four kilograms, and uh, the occasional single uh, should be at least five kilograms. And we will call a you who has a second single. So singles are not common and certainly not desirable in a uh, in, in our type of environment for weaning weights uh, we we uh, take lambs after the first two uh, into the nursery so mothers are expected to raise two lambs on their own and the extra lambs go into the nursery we expect lambs in the nursery to uh, wean at 30 days uh, at at least 10 kilograms and uh, from off the mother we're weaning at uh, at 56 days at, at, at eight weeks, and uh, we expect the lambs to wean at uh, 20 kilograms. Um, some uh, adjustment for uh, first lammers, the ewe uh, lambs lambing for the first time frequently will not be able to uh, wean a lamb at, uh, at 20 kilograms. It'll be more like uh, 15, 16 kilograms, uh, but we, we see that only in the initial lambing, and typically that's when a uh, a ewe lamb lambing for the first time has triplets so that uh, she doesn't have the body condition to uh, uh, give the milk production to produce that weight. But otherwise, we don't see uh, that as an issue. And certainly we would be culling if we we're not able to maintain that that uh, weaning weight. From a market perspective, our market is generally speaking uh, a lamb that weighs uh, about 50 kilograms. So we're looking to ship uh, lambs to market at, at around 100 days for singles and twins and uh, around 120 days for uh, triplets and quads and quints. Uh, we would look to, to reach that 50 kilogram weight in 100 days and the uh, 40 kilogram weight for the uh, triplets and, and uh, more at, at 100. <clears throat> so one of the keys to uh, our operation is aggressive culling. And uh, one of the fortunate things for us is that owning a processing plant, we're able to get good value from a cull U. And uh, in fact, more and more, we're seeing that uh, young cull U's uh, will produce a value that's similar to a, uh, a lamb. So uh, today we're getting three or $400 for a cull U uh, 
they would be heavier. They'd be, you know, typically uh, 65 to 70 kilograms, but uh, they're producing that same return. So we are motivated to uh, cull a non-performer, uh, but it helps that we're able to get that kind of return for the, uh, for the cull animal. So when we're culling ewes um, and selecting uh, the ewe that's going to be retained as a replacement, uh, we're, uh, we're looking for those ewes that are uh, productive in our environment. Um, so particularly, we're looking for ewes that can maintain a condition score uh, so that when they come to lamb, or come to be bred, I mean, their uh, condition at about three and a half. That means a month after weaning, they've got back into a condition of three and a half. And our ewes will, um, will frequently exit uh, weaning at a condition under three. Um, and so they're, they're needing to put weight on fairly quickly to get back into condition. Uh, we expect our ewe to lamb for its first lambing within the first 18 months. And most of our ewes are lambing at, uh, in month 13 or 14. So they're, they're bred at uh, five or six months and uh, will lamb at 13 or 14 months. And uh, on that basis, they'll uh, continue to lamb uh, uh, on a regular basis. We found that that's one of the keys to uh, year round lambing uh, is the ability to lamb early. Uh, ewes are all scanned um, after uh, breeding to uh, ensure that they're uh, that they're going to lamb again in the uh, within the uh, within the eight month cycle. So uh, ewes must be pregnant 130 days after the last lambing, and if they're not, uh, again they will be. If they're a ewe lamb, they'll be given a second chance. If they're not a ewe lamb, they will be culled at that point. Uh, ewes must wean lambs if the uh, if we find that. The lambs are uh, are dying not at birth, but but during the the uh, lactation process. Clearly, that ewe doesn't have the milk supply or the mothering instinct, and uh, and she'll go to market. Uh, we want our our ewes to uh, deliver three and a half lambs uh, every year. So that's on a two year basis. Uh, we expect the ewe to uh, have seven lambs uh, ready for the market. Uh, in that two-year period. We're not quite there today, but that's our objective. And uh, replacements uh, are selected from those ewes that are producing that kind of return. We have a large number of ewes that are delivering uh, four lambs a year on a regular basis. And of course, uh, ewes udders must be sound after uh, after lambing. Uh, an interesting note is that when you're looking at your, your ewes after weaning and you see ewes that uh, look fabulous or in great condition, that's probably your worst performer because she hasn't let the lambs take the milk from her or she's probably not delivered more than two lambs uh, and therefore she's not going to be uh, uh, a ewe that would, would be from whom replacements would be selected and she may not even be a ewe that you want in your flock going forward at all. Um, in our case, we're not culling ewes based on age. Some people ask that question frequently. We, ba- we cull strictly based on performance. And uh, the majority of our ewes after the first lambing will uh, lamb it, uh, at least 12 more times before they're culled. So that would be eight years after the first uh, lambing. And we've certainly had ewes that have had uh, 20, 21 uh, lambings in a 12 year uh, period and have been successful up to, up to that point. So use, uh, culling use, you know, lambs that are, are going to be selected uh, should meet the uh, selection criteria of uh, weaning weights and rams that are going to be retained uh, should have lambs or, or should have themselves uh, met the uh, rate of gain criteria, but also should be tracked to ensure that the uh, lambs that are their offspring are meeting this uh, rate of gain criteria. Rams um, really are the... Uh, the source of most gain after weaning and ewes are the source of uh, most gain uh, in the uh, lactation period. We found the, the ram has a bigger effect on birth weight. So uh, the, the ram has the, the birth weight of biggest effect and then the uh, rate of gain after weaning uh, most significant effect. So when we're culling rams, we want the uh, ram to uh, come back into condition. So typically a ram will, will have a two month uh, uh, reset period after the last breeding uh, until the next breeding, and it should get back into uh, good condition. Our, our, our rams will lose a lot of condition during the breeding period uh, because it's so concentrated. 
And uh, so we want to make sure they're coming in in good condition. Uh, when we're selecting a ram for replacement, obviously scrotum is a, uh, a key factor. We look for uh, scrotums that are, are good size, typically, you know, over 30 centimeter uh, circumference. And uh, that uh, scrotum should increase. So an older ram uh, would be expected to have a, uh, a scrotum circumference of closer to 40 centimeters. Uh, we, we look for any injuries or, or thickening or abscesses and, uh, and make sure that, of course, they have two uh, solid uh, 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 testes to uh, produce the sperm. Uh, we, we typically will collect uh, sperm from every ram that's uh, going to be used in the next breeding cycle. Uh, in doing so, we also have our vets look for uh, injuries with sheath rot, um, any abnormalities. Uh, we verify the quality of the semen three to four weeks before it's used for breeding. We want to make sure that there are no uh, semen deformities, but also that there's good uh, semen motility. Uh, that is the activity level of the sperm so that it'll swim up and get into the uh, uterus to uh, fertilize that egg. And we verify the libido. Uh, you can have the, uh, the ram with the uh, most aggressive sperm and the largest quantity and the, and the largest uh, uh, scrotum size, but it turns out he's not interested in, in use. So you need to verify that by uh, putting your rams uh, next to the uh, ewe flock uh, prior to the uh, insertion of the uh, uh, of, the, of the sponge to, uh, to cause the breeding. So we will put our uh, rams next to the uh, next group of ewes to be bred, make sure that the, uh, that the rams are interested in the ewes, that they're going to the, to the fence and, uh, and, and, and exhibiting considerable uh, interest in the ewes that are uh, coming into heat. Um, so once you've got your selected flock, uh, your U and, and RAM flock, and your uh, program for ongoing uh, culling and replacement selection, uh, the next thing to focus on is uh, is feeding. And as I mentioned in in our experience, 80% uh, of the operating cost of bringing a lamb to market is the feed. So you clearly need to focus on uh, utilizing that feed most efficiently. Uh, the other thing to note is that 80% of the uh, fetal development, so birth weight of that lamb, uh, occurs in the, uh, you know, the, the, the 100 to 150 days before birth. So it's important that the ewe be fed properly in the uh, last, uh, uh, in, in the last quarter of her uh, uh, gestation to make sure that that lamb is going to come out uh, with the proper size and, and proper vigor. Uh, in, in terms of feed conversion, this is something that, that people are frequently surprised at when we, when we discuss this, but in the, uh, you know, the first 40 days, obviously lambs don't eat a lot in that time frame, but in the first 40 days, uh, we're getting a feed conversion of one to one. So we want that lamb to eat as much as possible of our uh, of our supplemental ration uh, in the first 40 days and, and in the, the second uh, you know, second period, the, the last second month, um, because those are the best feed conversion days. Uh, and, and the more you can get that that lamb eating the supplemental feed, the easier it's going to be when they're weaned for them to continue to eat properly and uh, continue that growth to a market weight. So these numbers say, you know, when, whereas in the, uh, you know, after weaning, you're getting three and a half to one uh, after um, uh, 100 days, you're you're up to four and a half and more. Uh, you know, certainly the our experience is that uh, conversion rates deteriorate very dramatically after 100 days. So it's important that the lambs be uh, at market weight around 100 days so that you're optimizing the feed conversion and therefore reducing your costs. Now, it isn't just a matter of, of intake. It's a matter of intake of the right ration. So uh, in our uh, environment, we use a feed specialist to uh, regularly monitor our uh, feed sources and develop a ration that's uh, optimal to uh, the, the the sheep at the various stages of their development. So we have rations for for uh, uh, lambs that are with the mother, lambs that are uh, are weaned and, and are now in the growth phase, uh, ewes that are being bred, ewes that are uh, are in the early stages of lactation and the late or early stages of gestation, late gestation and lactation. So different different rations produced for for um, the animals based on where they are in their uh, in their cycle. 
all of our um, all of our sheep are fed a, a TMR ration. So you can see here the the uh, feed is is uh, presented in, in this uh, scenario uh, that, that you're looking at. The uh, animals are all eating at the same time. So the uh, the ration is fed, and uh, we expect them to uh, eat it all up uh, before they'll get fed again. Uh, and and that uh, in in our particular situation in in this uh, scenario in the feedlot, uh, we're feeding twice a day and uh, feeding the quantity that the animals will clean up in that time frame. So our our TMR, uh, a total mixed ration, is uh, formulated uh, in conjunction with the feed specialist using the feeds that are available to us uh, and uh, using the uh, uh, requirements that animals have at the right stage. So in the uh, in the early stages, lambs are fed a pellet ration. It's a, uh, a, a total ration that's uh, formulated to the needs of a, a fast growing lamb. So uh, 18 per 16 to 18% protein and, uh, and pellets are fed uh, freely available. They can eat as much as they want. And, uh, and of course we hope they eat as much as they want. Uh, other, um, uh, other rations can be made using whole grains with a supplement and uh, we have on occasion done that. Um, it's important if you're going to use pellets that the pellets be uh, formulated with the right size, but also the right uh, firmness. Uh, lambs don't do well if the uh, pellet is dusty. And so if you're not able to get a pellet that doesn't uh, dust out, then uh, I would suggest using a whole grain ration with a supplement. And our, uh, our ewes are fed a uh, hay grain uh, ration that is supplemented with, uh, with byproducts and, uh, and mineral additives to uh, produce a whole ration. In our experience, uh, sheep lambing three times in two years, uh, particularly those that are prolific, uh, will require a TMR that grazing uh, supplemented by uh, grain just doesn't provide the, um, the necessary uh, feed value that they need to be able to, uh, uh, to, to produce lambs at this rate. So we use uh, this type of feeder um, for pellets or, or grain and, and supplement. Um, not perfectly clear uh, from looking at the picture, but this uh, particular feeder has the ability to have the opening adjusted so that only lambs can eat it uh, and use can. So you can put the, the feeder in the pen with the ewes and lambs and the, uh, the lambs will be able to eat from it, but the ewes won't. And then this same feeder is used when the lambs are weaned so that they're used to the feeder and they can continue to eat as much as they want from this particular feeder. <clears throat> so we, we have two uh, uh, types of, of uh, feeding systems. Uh, free feeding is where ration is always available and animals can eat as much as they want. And uh, that ration or that feeding system is used when you don't have enough bunk space. So if, um, if you want your lambs to uh, have the, the maximum growth possible, then feeding them pellets or, or grain and supplement out of that feeder works perfectly. That, that's what we always do for, for uh, lambs in the feedlot. But for ewes, it's only used when you don't have enough bunk space to allow uh, all the ewes to get up and eat at the same time because they will eat more than they need typically uh, and the uh, larger animal will uh, uh, frequently uh, prevent the smaller one from getting its fair share of eating. So uh, you, you ideally want to have a bunk system that allows all the ewes in the pen to eat at the same time and that way you can use a control ration where you're feeding them once or twice a day uh, but to the level that they're able to uh, clean up uh, all the feed that uh, is provided. So you'll minimize the uh, amount of feed that they get. And uh, at the same time, you uh, ensure that they get the uh, intake of the, uh, of the right quantity and the right quality of ration that they need. Uh, this is pretty difficult to see, but the, the key I wanted to know with the ration is that the ration needs to include the you know the vitamins and minerals that are at the level that are necessary to optimize the the growth of the lamb. So when you're providing a formula to your pellet maker or your or your um, supplement maker, these uh, specific 
uh, mineral and, and vitamin uh, requirements need to be clearly spelled out and the uh, ration that needs to be feed tested to ensure that they've met those uh, specifications before you're providing it as a, uh, as a starter ration or in the case of the U ration, the, uh, this is an example of our early lactation, again, formulated from the ingredients that we have available uh, and based on the uh, calculated um, a feed value of that and what the requirements are for the animal. Uh, in this case, I specifically uh, want to make people aware that uh, we need some buffering when we're feeding uh, um, ewes a, a high energy ration. We need to make sure that we're using uh, calcium chloride and calcium phosphate to uh, buffer the rumen so that you don't end up with, uh, with uh, problems of the rumen getting too hot and burning out. Sheep productivity and labor. So here's um, here, here's a challenge that we have, and I suspect most people will have. That competent people or reliable people are are difficult to find and uh, and difficult to retain um, and and difficult to pay. You can't uh, you can't pay people a fortune, uh, but you uh, you do need them to be reliable to uh, ensure that you're, you're getting the lambs that you expected from the investment that you've made in. Uh, in genetics and in feeding and in and facilities. So um, we, we, we work aggressively to reduce the amount of labor that's required so that we can pay people a, uh, a, a, good, a good wage for the work they do. And we can judge them on the basis of the performance of the, uh, of the lambs that are going to market in the used condition after, uh, after lambing. Uh, and the, uh, the key typically to uh, labor for us is that you have lambs that are vigorous and healthy at birth, and then you have a feeding system that's as automated as possible. So that uh, the, uh, the time that the uh, labor is invested in is, uh, is helping to move animals, to uh, make sure that animals are ready for breeding, the, uh, you know, the specific uh, vaccinations and, and uh, so on that they require, uh, the ongoing, uh, 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 eyesight tracking of, of the condition of ewes and lambs so that uh, problems can be uh, seen early and uh, corrections can be applied before they become uh, uh, too serious. So the, uh, the key element of our uh, systems is all based on the fact that we're uh, managing every single animal as a production unit. Um, and so every animal has an RFID tag and that RFID tag is being uh, scanned as the animal moves through its system so that there's a minimal amount of, of um, manual writing. In fact, almost no manual records are being, uh, are being developed by the people who work in the operation. It's all being uh, captured from the um, uh, RFID tag, from the scales, from the sorting, um, from the treatment center and from the uh, feeding systems. So uh, again, our evaluation of, uh, of which animals we're gonna select is not typically based on the look of the animal. Uh, in fact, we don't care about things like wool color or uh, wool quality or uh, size of the animal. We only care about their performance and the performance of, of that genetics. Um, so we're, uh, we're, we're using the, the computer system to do that selection and the, um, the individual inv uh, human involvement only occurs when you've got things like injuries or, or uh, uh, you know, uh, toes that have grown too long for some reason or uh, udder that's become uh, damaged. Uh, but, but most of the selection and all of the uh, replacement selections being uh, generated from the analysis of the records. So here's um, an example of a couple of our feeding systems. In this case, we've got a, a TMR ration that's being provided uh, to be used on a uh, a regular basis so this is uh, twice a day this feeder is being filled and uh, it's as you can see coming from the top completely automated based on the clock time uh, there's no manual labor involved in doing that and the uh, feeder itself is being filled up from a uh, an external source so there's a human operator um, on the mill that chops the feed up but that feed is then dumped into the uh, unloading unit that uh, fills this uh, uh, this feeding uh, robot and the robot goes along the uh, feed bunk and uh, and drops the feed 
here's uh, our betting system. Uh, betting uh, what was typically a very challenging um, facility. It, it's awkward to bring the bales into the barn. It's uh, difficult to make sure that the uh, person who's responsible is putting the appropriate amount of bedding in each pen. Uh, so we have a robot now that takes and uh, brings chopped straw, um, trop bedding into the uh, mix. And again, this sometimes allows us to use byproducts like um, wood chips, but mainly we're using uh, wheat straw and the uh, robot will go along and, uh, and, and spread straw uh, through the day into the pen. Uh, this uh, allows the animals to uh, access some uh, fresh uh, carbon if they need the, the um, if they need the uh, straw to uh, make the room more effective. But more importantly, it it significantly reduces labor by eliminating the need for human involvement in the uh, in the bedding. And we found that we can uh, bed with much less uh, bedding, so for much less expense, uh, both in terms of buying the straw and also cleaning the pens out, uh, but more effectively. We're reducing the uh, moisture buildup, we're reducing contamination in the pen by having regularly uh, spreading new straw. And this unit will spread straw again twice a day into the uh, into the penning. And if uh, for whatever reason we have very high moisture, we can adjust it so it'll spread the straw four times a day if that's uh, more appropriate. And here's a, another uh, a example of a feeding system. So this feeding system is being used in our uh, uh, pre lambing barn. So these animals are lambing <coughs> in these jugs and, and the feed is being dropped along the uh, edge of the uh, pen where the, the ewes are waiting to lamb. Uh, they'll, they'll pick the, the feed up again twice a day uh, and adjust it based on the uh, fact that these ewes are uh, are in their late uh, gestation and ensuring that the, uh, that the feed is uh, appropriate for that environment. And again, no labor involved. This uh, occurs twice a day and uh, and, and happens without any manual intervention. So we can schedule this to occur at convenient times for the, uh, for the workforce. So finally, the management systems, if, um, if you're going to manage for profit, you need to understand your costs and your revenue. So uh, we we say every year we prepare a budget and that budget helps us to understand uh, where it's appropriate to make investments, uh, where we uh, are going to see uh, a need to make adjustments because of uh, changing costs, for, for example, changing costs of feed or um, because we've uh, uh, found uh, you know a new way of... Uh, of, of doing something that reduces the amount of labor. So those kinds of adjustments are, are, uh, are hammered out in the budgeting process. And uh, every year we uh, are, you know, are regularly thinking forward to uh, how we're going to improve uh, the operation. As I mentioned, uh, we manage our animals as individuals uh, for uh, replacements and culling. For feeding, we manage groups of animals. So the, uh, the a group that's being bred, the next group to lamb, the, uh, the, the, the group of lambs that are being weaned, the uh, group of lambs that are uh, nearing 100 days and ready to uh, go to market, those are fed as a group. And uh, therefore, we, we know what their feed needs are. We can prepare the ration. We can distribute the ration in the appropriate quantities at the appropriate time. And... Uh, and, and make a and maintain a record of uh, what it's costing us to uh, feed uh, that group of animals. And understanding your revenue sources. So I mentioned at the beginning in marketing, we need to make sure that uh, we're constantly in touch with the um, uh, with the processor and and constantly uh, evaluating what our carcass uh, qualities are in terms of of the carcass grade, the carcass yield. Uh, what the feedback is from the um, from the plant, and typically, uh, hopefully, the plant is feeding us back what the um, uh, response is from the consumer and the retailer to uh, the, the land that we're producing. Um, the other part is is byproducts. Uh, it's important in, in to the extent that that the that the producer can get value from byproducts, but it's important that the overall value chain is getting in value from uh, from byproducts. Our, uh, our revenue from um, the, uh, the, the wool is, is fairly minimal uh, because the lambs that we, uh, or the sheep that we 
produced don't have a, a fine quality of wool. And, uh, and because of the way we feed, um, the wool tends to be contaminated with a lot of straw. But there, are, there is value in the, in the lamb pelt. Um, there's value in the, uh, in, in the wool uh, for miscellaneous activities like insulation or uh, cleanup of oil spills. Uh, there's, there's value in some of the byproducts like the intestines, the, uh, the organ meats. Uh, it's a matter of finding the right buyer uh, and even the um, the uh, the bone and and uh, uh, and and, <clears throat> and um, rumen byproducts uh, have value in some marketplaces. So we're able to uh, sell some things to Mexico, some things to China, some things to the Philippines, some things to specialty uh, uh, retailers who can uh, get value out of these um, out of these byproducts and uh, the byproducts are uh, producing sufficient revenue to uh, cover off uh, the cost of all of our processing with a little bit of margin. Uh, so the, uh, the lamb production is, uh, is able to sustain the cost of the processing and still produce the full return to the uh, lamb producer. So that's kind of a quick overview. Hopefully uh, that uh, provides you with some, some thoughts in terms of how you might adjust uh, your operation to uh, be more profitable and, uh, and and maybe if labor is as much of an issue for you as for us, how you can do it with um, a reduction in labor. All right, so I hope you uh, enjoyed the overview. This is uh, an introduction to what we've been doing to uh, improve the productivity of our sheep operation. And if you have additional questions, then we can work uh, through those uh, if, if you're interested in doing something. Uh, but our operation is designed for uh, larger sheep businesses, at least 5,000 ewes.